Oh, that's weird. It's already started, eh? Never quite understand that. All right, whatever. Doing it live. Where's the stupid thing? Transition it back. Welcome to the show. Hey, guys. Bit different. This one's going to be pretty straightforward. I was going to start it with some cheeky shit, but I'm like, eh, whatever. Oh, I already swore in the first 30 seconds. We just lost monetization. Oh, son of a bitch. Welcome, Red Morning, the Red Pillist podcast that's ever. I'm, I'm trying something new on this one. I'm trying to treat it as if none of you guys have ever heard of this before. Because there's a chance that there's some new people. They don't know what it's about. They probably don't know much about anything except for what uh, Taterhead and Fresh and Fit have been telling them. Which, are Fresh and Fit even still a thing? Or did that cancellation actually cancel them? Anyway, I see a bunch of you in chat. I know we're a couple minutes behind. What is the red pill? What is the what is the red morning? All this stuff. So we'll get into it. So everybody thinks the red pill is just about the Godfather, Rolo Tomasi, but it's red pill is not Rolo. In fact, it was originally, well, originally it was three guys. Well, originally it was like a whole bunch of guys, but there's three main guys. They call them the three R's. There's Rolo Tomasi, Bruce V, and Roycey. Roycey and DC. Remember those ones? Hey, Couch, how often should a red pill Alpha G be thinking about the Roman Empire? My girl actually asked me about that one. I'm more of a World War One guy, but that's fine. Anyway. And so everything was just blogs back then. It was a blogosphere, you know. Everybody had blogs. Everybody linked to others' blogs. You kind of created these very informal networks. It was pretty neat. And there was a bunch of different mail spaces. There was the, the MGTOWs, the men going their own way, which... Depending on who you ask, it was either it was partially disenfranchised pickup artists who were like, oh, it turns out like this is boring. I don't like it anymore. And a lot of men's rights guys that were tired of women taking over the space. Hey, sound familiar? Anyways, this red pill one was based off of uh, there was a lot of old stuff. Rolo goes back as far as 2003, but I didn't really see much of it until 2008, 2007, 2008 with Kaoni Galt and his uh, Game is Red Pill article. It's a pretty good one. And I'd say it accurately sums up the space. It really does. It was a couple examples he used of just how baseline, standard, mainstream, perfectly, you know, female approved, acceptable ways of dealing with relationships, completely false. And he was like, he was picking, he used double binds as an example. It's a great one. He calls it the emasculation paradox. But if you've, if you've ever studied psychology, you're probably going to know these as uh, narcissistic double binds. Basically, you put somebody in a situation where no matter what they do, it's wrong. It's a it's a control measure. And he was just using the examples like, hey, what if you, uh, the girl says, what color paint do you want for the house? And if you pick this color, it's wrong. And if you pick this color, it's also wrong. So you're better off just not saying anything. And that is, and then eventually moved on to uh, this other guy, Dalrock, who was, again, very influential in the space, talking about threat point. And the point that he made to it is with these double binds, guys, if they stick to their, you know, the way they were raised, you're going to end up having no answers. They just disengage. But, and because they do this because they think it will prevent them from getting in trouble from the women or in trouble from your wife or in trouble from whatever authority figure in your head. The problem is that by not standing up for yourself, by not walking on eggshells you're actually encouraging the worst behavior out of women and so it always it was like it was really neat to see that 2008 2009 2010 they had answered the age-old question everybody asked whose fault is it men or women and the answer is yes women a lot of divorced moms raising men to be defective women or nothing like that asshole ex-husband of hers and then a lot of those guys being raised to be more codependent to be more submissive all the things that made men men were trained out of them, and then the men are reinforcing themselves. We're like on the third generation of this. So like the first divorced women had promise keeper men. It's another red-pilled concept of guys who are like, they value their mom because she's the only parent parent they see, even if they're together. Guys working at the factory all day, so you know kids never see dad, they only see mom. It's not like we were agricultural when dad was always home working on the farm. 
So when there is an issue there, guys always take mom's side over dad's side, and then they do everything that dad doesn't do in the idea of that that's going to make me a good person. The problem is dad knocked up your mom. So he's got some qualities that matter. And then guys are finding later on when they get into romantic relationships, they default to those same behaviors. Doesn't work. Now, here's the funny part. Those couples, that's the second generation now, have that guy raising these men to be exactly like him. And he stays together with mom and he gets kind of, you know, beat up, submissive. The the dads, you guys see the stories, the ones where dad's like, he was always a bit of a pushover and mom was always a bit of a battle axe and kind of resentful over it. Even Bill Burr had a sketch about that. Remember that the old guy with like the, the, the chick that he was married to him that didn't never got to see Paris, never got to see Paris. And so you have this second generation of men raised to be effective women. And now they have a guy and a girl raising them to be an effective woman. And they know something's wrong and it's, you know, but the problem is when you're put in a situation, you don't act according to your expectations, you devolve into your training. So now we're like on a third generation of this of extremely codependent men. And I would argue there is a validation seeking codependent form of narcissism you see everywhere now. And it's just, it pops up in all these little places. And this is why I honestly believe that the ideas that you'll see within the red pill proper are definitely important. Definitely important. Because you see it everywhere. Like the, when I always, you always see me making fun of these, the fuck trophies for clout. People who use their family as social media props. One guy literally was on Twitter this week telling me his kids were more, were hotter than Pat Stedman's kids. And he flexes all the time. And I'm just a loser and a hell, jealous hater. And I was like, holy Jesus Christ, dude. But you see what I mean? Yeah, it's third generations of being neutered. And here's the funniest part about this, too, is that it's nobody's fault. It's just the way things kind of roll out. If you change the environment to the way we have it now. So there's nobody to blame. It'd be nice if there was somebody to blame, because as soon as you can blame it on the, you know, lizard. Pe oh, sorry, the three three bracket lizard people. <laughs> as soon as you can blame it on them, then there's an adversary. And guys really do thrive when it's adversarial, but... Who do you fight when there's nobody at the helm? Industrial revolution created a situation where men aren't at home raising their kids. They're out working, you know, whether it's in an office or a factory. So men are gone. Women are starting to take over child rearing and then women start to go into the workforce too. So now it's like latchkey kids. So nobody's raising. Then divorce became a thing. And now, you know, mom gets custody. So nobody's really raising the kids, but mom's the one authority figure. And there's that constant string of, uh, be a good boy or mommy will abandon you. And it, you don't even have to be old to see this. It's not hard. I'm sure a lot of you guys have girlfriends. I'm hoping a lot of you guys have girlfriends. If this is the incel power hour, I'm fucking out of here. But uh, you guys have girlfriends. Do you guys have dogs? Do you ever watch when the dog's misbehaving, how the girl kind of just like loses her emotional shit on like a dog? It's pretty funny to watch. Now, dogs don't care. But people, when mom is yelling at like a kid... Kids take that as like a fear of abandonment, fight or flight kind of response. Because, you know, this is the one that feeds me. I better I better make her happy. And because she's not consistent, dad's consistent, usually. Dad's like, you know, do your thing, do your chores, pick up your stuff. Don't worry about it. And they, they're very, very tolerant of behavior and generally speaking, much more patient. Mom, on the other hand, is emotional. So, uh, if you get something that, you know, sometimes this is bad when she's in a bad mood and sometimes this isn't bad when she's not in a bad mood. So how is a kid supposed to process that? It's like, it's not that sometimes things are good and sometimes things are bad and there's a moral gray area. It's that whoever has the power makes the rules. If you ever wondered too, and this is where I'm like little bits of it pop up everywhere. You know how everybody all of a sudden is a communist lately. It was the weirdest thing. Berlin wall fell 20 years past. All of a sudden everybody's like, you know, communism wasn't half bad. I'm like, I don't know. I guess we haven't had a famine in a while. Why not? Um, yeah, that's why. That's that whole authoritative thing. That whole authoritative streak you see. That's why in Canadian politics, we always have like despot, petty tyrants because they're all coming out of Quebec. And Quebec is Canada's forefront of all of this nonsense. Everybody, you, you can tell when somebody's in Quebec, when somebody's from Quebec, not because they have a French sounding name, it's because they have a hyphenated last name. Everybody in Quebec has a hyphenated last name. I'm actually curious how kids are going to be in this generation. Do you have... If you have two sets of hyphenated last names on the parents, how many hyphens do you give the kids? Is it like four? Is this how you ended up with those long, drawn-out names of kings in the 13th century? 
Was it really just feminism? Who knows? Yeah, see, and you just have to open your eyes. It's not It's not like it's a big leap of faith to take this. Uh, Ian is talking about it in chat right now. Watching that shit in real time with my neighbor. Single mom, twin boys, high strung, neurotic. The boys shut down. My son and I are basically a refuge. Oh, dude, and it's... Um, it's probably one of the best things you could do. Like I had that. I, I mean, I had, I had a decent upbringing. I mean, I had a shitty childhood, but a decent upbringing. And I remember that my friend with his stable parents and he and his brother, and we used to play around on his ranch. It was great times. So a lot of the times just being the, the friend's house they go play with. It's like, it lets people know that there's an option out there other than neurotic mother or what the hell I should do a Peterson thing. What's he call it? Babylon mother evil somebody here who's a Peterson fan could you let me know <laughs> I don't remember what he used it was like the some evil woman archetype I don't know uh, Anglo switching from wokeism is communism to based post-communist Eastern European culture is always funny oh yeah the whole thing is just ridiculous uh you want to ask about rule zero that's a good question I think it's on Clary's channel today to be honest with you so in the future you don't have to ask what I generally do is add it to the redirect and if i don't have a redirect set up then it's it's probably on thor's channel oh clary doesn't have one either <laughs> fair enough yeah friend uses my house as a safe place and it's because kids like kids don't have any frame of reference they don't know anything and it's pure emotion and that's the problem when you got mom yelling at you all the time it's like a constant fight or flight response and so they know something's wrong can't narrow it down but because they have no frame of reference, they're like, well, this is just how things are. Women are angry. You got to be fair, afraid of their emotions and you have to, you know, try to make them happy as best you can. And then you go hide somewhere, hide the badness. It's, And this is what I'm talking about when I talk about like the, the proper red pill proper. Robert Glover, no more Mr. Nice Guy. It is as much as Rollo Tomasi's book is great. Everybody loves it. It's good. It is not. It is not the number one premier red pilled tome it's not robert glover's no more mr nice guy is because it's essentially like the rollo's great for ten thousand foot view bunch of mental models this is how things are the, the dynamics at play absolutely useful totally glover had 20 years as a therapist and he was finding that all guys kind of had the same issues and so he put it together in a book and that's one example is hiding the badness when you're worried about female validation and female appeasement the one thing you do is you hide your flaws, hoping that they don't notice them. So what are your flaws in this case? Well, it's anything that makes the girl angry. And I know it seems weird where you're like, why would I be? I'm not scared of some chick or whatever. It's like you are, but you don't really know it. It's not, that's how instincts work. You don't really think about it. If you did think about it, you realize it's ridiculous. It's that three-year-old kid that got yelled at by mom. And then the kids have that instinctive need to try and appease her. That just gets carried on throughout a kid's life. As he gets older, it becomes more sophisticated and he develops more mental models that surround this thing. And it becomes it becomes a worldview. That's why if you've ever heard us say you cannot red pill your friends, don't try to proselytize that stuff. That's why. And I, and I hate I hate I hate to use a matrix reference. I get it. It's goofy. It's the star. It's the movie from the trans people. And you're like, relax. It actually fits here. They, they don't want to be unplugged. People are too far gone. They are too attached to this identity and until there's like a traumatic level of pain people are just going to keep going through life with that low-key low-grade misery that they always have and if you try to help them they will burn you for it i have seen story after story time after time epic saga of epic sagas where some husband horrible wife situation like that his best friend red pills him teaches him the thing maybe his wife's not the greatest thing ever there's a bunch of stuff he should work on what does the friend do he goes and rats him out to his wife and now they don't want to hang out with him anymore because he's an evil red-pilled misogynist and then the ex-wife or the soon-to-be ex-wife goes onto twitter ranting about how roger tomarso ruined her husband it's like do you really want to waste all of that social capital because you read a book and you want the guy to read it it's not dianetics man it's not dianetics Horror Babylon, maybe. Real one should be don't red pill your friends. Yeah. It's one of those, and because it, it's, it's not really, I guess, how do I want to put this? By the way, off topic, I'm sitting here, I'm looking at the monitor, and I realized I'm, I'm, I'm become Stefan Molyneux. 
<laughs> like, fuck. <laughs> Remember that? Where you used to just stand at the white background and stare at you and ramble for two hours about philosophy or, I don't know, how the whites are doing something or whatever. It's like, oh. I always thought it was kind of cringe. I was never a big fan of it. Now I look here and I'm just like, I have I have become what I hate. <laughs> Shouldn't Robert Greene be considered the father of Red Pill? No. Look, man. And this is my personal opinion. It's like on this part, but I think Robert Greene, it's not overrated, but it's not accurately rated. So for example, 48 Laws of Power, it is considered the same thing. It's a sidebar a sidebar book. In other words, if there's a canon in the Red Pill, for, Robert Greene makes the list. Absolutely. Here's the problem. Uh, the kind of idiots that read this Machiavellian tome, 48 Laws of Power, expected to become Machiavellian, are just, it's just cringe. The 48 Laws of Power, is it, it does a really neat trick too, where they talk about a rule, one of those laws, and then they talk about the reciprocal, the times when it doesn't apply. So you got all your bases covered. So in that sense, it's it's a fun book, but it can't be wrong because it 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 covers its own ass. Well, sometimes you have to like don't outshine the master, but in this case, outshine the master. But you see what I mean? Like it's not a book, it's not instructions, it's not mental models. It's a way it's just a way of looking at problems. You have to think for yourself. So, I mean, in the back case, the book does well for it. And at the same time, it's one of those things where you kind of want to read it and then forget about it. Don't want to think about it because as soon as you start trying to apply the 48 laws to your life, things get weird. You start acting all Asperger-y. It's just awkward. Generally speaking, what you're supposed to do is have them in the back of your mind. And then when something happens, every now and then you're like, this kind of reminds me of something. And then you go to the, the rules and you're like, oh yeah, it's like a rule 17 thing. That's cool. So learn it, forget it, move on with your life. And then when it comes up, utilize it otherwise don't worry about it anything similar to read after be slightly evil oh uh tempo tempo is the other book by van katesh it's just as good as well as the gervais principle yeah unplugging chumps is dirty work well look at this rob hello stefan sir quiet you aren't you where aren't you in the the state where they they make white people Are you talking to me about this stuff yeah, exactly. Chuck's got it. Situationally applied, at best. And that's why it's always Robert Glover and it's always Manuel Smith. I have been harping. I've been. How long have I been doing this for? Hold up a sec. Is he really going to his channel? It's like, yeah, I don't know how long I've been on YouTube for. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna find out today. Uh, how do you go to your channel? View your channel. Videos, oldest. Four years. So I've been four years I've been doing this. And every time I've been harping on Robert Glover, Manuel Smith, Rolo Tomasi in that order. Holy jeez. And you know the funny part is like I looked at the old ones. It's cooking. It was the cooking videos. I was making Madeleine's omelets, uh, salsa, and cranberry sauce. What were the topics? Dread and no more Mr. Nice Guy. So I've been harping on the same thing for this entire time. Uh, free gender, five dollars. Uh, what's with the what's with the cuck article? Well, that's a heartfelt f you, sir. What's the one where guys in a cave finds out shadows in the wall are actually from outside, tells his friends, and they kill him for it? That's uh that's Plato's cave. Yeah, Plato's cave. Which is it's a slightly different thing. Plato's cave is just about people don't actually see reality; they just see the projection of reality onto them. And then the guy who actually opens his eyes and goes and looks, he explains like, dude, you guys have been lied to. And they're like, shut up. And they murder him. It's that people prefer their pleasant lies. Actually, I guess that could kind of apply here. Yeah. Oh, look at this. I have a friend I went and seen last night because he's a DJ and makes his own music. And he was telling me he's going to rehab in a week because his ex meant so much to him. He can't stop binging on shit. Jesus. And, and to be fair, there is like an addictive quality to women. It turns out, like you ever notice that breakups hit guys especially hard, women not as much? It's because of dopamine, sirs. It turns out the same hormones you get from heroin are the hormones you get when, you, uh, when you're with a girl. You know, when you fall in love. Aw. So when you guys have a breakup or a murder, that's why they, they affect you particularly hard because you're going through oh, dopamine withdrawals. A lot of people call that pair bonding. It's not quite accurate. 
It's not like it's a mating for life thing. It's just like a small addiction. It's like caffeine. So how funny is that? Yeah, also women start to break up mentally six months before it happens. Here's the thing on this. I mean, you guys have seen... This is one of those... It's one of those things that bugs me about the red pill is that there would be awesome places to critique. And if you wanted to go after it, there's a lot of things you could attack. This is kind of one of them. If you've ever seen, there's two concepts that are simultaneously existing with the red pill and nobody cares. It's alpha widows and war brides. You ever seen this? That's another two more red pill concepts. These are from Rolo stuff. War brides is the idea that women have to get over a man very quickly because, you know, men go to war, men die more often. And so women have kind of evolved to get over a man and fall in love with her cat with her captors or whatever, right? Survival instinct. Because the women that were loyal to their men would end up getting killed. And then the ones that weren't loyal and, you know, made with the new guy, they did all right. But then you've also got alpha widowing. You're like, what the hell is that? Well, that's apparently when you're dating a girl and she just, she got... And I think Royce did this one where he talks about five minutes of alpha trumps a lifetime of beta. I think it's what he calls it. You know, she dated Brad Pitt for like five minutes and now she's with this new guy and she can't stop thinking about the old one. And you see those and there's stories of like old ladies about the one that got away. Fuck, they made Titanic. What is Titanic if not an idea of alpha widowing? Yeah, I get it. It's fiction. But the point is a lot of chicks resonated with that story. So there's at least there's at least a glimmer of truth in there. Or at least a glimmer of want for truth in there, you know? Oh, shut up, boss. <laughs> uh, Rob, I haven't heard the black people in Utah are white. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. And you could totally be like, well, how do you reconcile those two things? And I'd, I'd argue you probably... It, it's not hard. But the point is nobody even tried. Which means nobody reads anything. And that's what kills me. The whole reason this space got to be as good as it is. And I'm, I'm not saying it's good. It it's really is a shithole. The only reason it got as good as it was is because a lot of guys really love to argue and bicker and moan amongst each other, experience things and write things down until they came up with stuff that worked. And you need that kind of adversarial moment. When you have emotionally inbred children yelling at you because of memorials, it doesn't really solve anything. But anyway, so I mean, the reconcile is not hard. The idea of war brides, it's pretty straightforward. If a girl breaks up with you, now there's mechanisms. And here's the thing, and this is why a lot of the arguments go nowhere. When you talk, when you talk about a concept like war brides dynamic, women hear that and they hear motive, which isn't true. They're like, I don't do that. It was actually there was something they called Schrodinger Schrodinger's Awalt. No, every woman is not like that until they are, and then it's like, oh, that's totally wrong. But you just did it. Yeah, it's not wrong. It's because they hear, when they hear that, they aren't hearing, this is a thing that happens. They're hearing, this is a judgment against you and that you're bad. And that's what they're fighting. They could care less if it's true or not. They just refuse to be seen as bad. That's why women freak the fuck out over mid. Mid. You're averagely attractive. There is nothing wrong with you. You're perfectly normal. Losing her fucking mind. What the fuck? I am not a mid. All right, what are you then? They take mids to mean horribly ugly. It's like, it's not. So anyways, the war bride thing. So that makes sense. And yeah, there's the mechanisms doesn't really matter. The idea is it's supposed to be a very top level view of it. Uh, was it Sluggo? Yeah, Sluggo. Also, women start to break up six months before it happens. Maybe that's the mechanism that happens. Maybe it is girls have just as hard a time as guys breaking up with people. But because they play act in the relationship while they take their next six months to plan their escape, they've gotten through all the emotions beforehand. So from our perspective... From our perspective, it looks like, oh, she just got, she just brought a man to her funeral, a new man to her husband's funeral. But in reality, that's probably this thing here. Now, is that right? Or is it true that they just flick a switch, light switch, and it goes off? Who fucking cares? That's the point. And this is why it's so hard to get this stuff through to guys, even if you were to try to red pill your friends. Because the concept of war brides, as you read it within the red pill, is from the male perception and the male perspective. And that's why people argue against it. It's not even it's not even whether it's right or wrong. It's that, in fact, you're coming at it from a man's perspective. And they'll argue, well, that's not how I did it. It was six months before we broke up. I was mentally prepared for it. Yeah, yeah maybe. We don't see that, though. We just see the end part where you brought a date to his funeral. So for guys, that's good enough. 
why and then there's all these guys they have to fight because they want like oh i got i can't have her look bad i have to look for a reason that makes her a good person it's like why why do you need a girl to be a good person when you hear something like this because you just can't be right why not and it all boils down to that initial thing mom is yelling at me and so i want to appease her it's just and they don't think it's that way that's how instincts work you don't think you have instincts instincts just instinct so welcome to the club So then, and then with the alpha widows, that's just a girl's not over a guy and she's dating a guy she's not into. The funny thing about this, and this is, I would say, I don't even know if it's a disagreement, but I'd say it's my take on, on the, uh, alpha widows is women and men make up stories, narrative, narrative based decision-making. That is how we think. We think in stories. We talk in stories. We process the world as in a narrative structure. That's why stories are so powerful. That's why you and I will sit here and listen to a story about a farm boy who picks up a lightsaber and then goes and fights his dad in some kind of samurai armor. And we think this is the greatest shit ever because we love stories. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, it's a human thing. It codes for humans. So the alpha widow thing, let's just say girls dating a guy. She's not into him. Maybe she has baby rabies. She's like, I'm 28. My clock's not going on forever. I need to have a baby. And this nice, pleasant man is willing to give me what I want. Great. I am so in love. Has the baby. Baby turns five. She realizes, like, she calls it postpartum. And I would argue postpartum depression is really post-nut clarity for women. It really is. When they realize, oh, my God, I was so desperate for a baby. I let this chump throw one into me. Fuck. I don't like him at all. He's such a wimp. Not so much an alpha widowing, but she starts thinking back to all the exciting men in her life. And if she particularly finds one that's either available or around or the story particularly compelling, she builds up this narrative. It's just it's just, and that's how memories work. It turns out our memories aren't a hard drive. They're more like they're more like instant replay. So every time we remember something, we're actually trying to relive it again and we're telling the story to ourselves again and then. The more times we tell it, the more we reinforce it. But that's why human memory is very fallible like that, because we're not remembering things. We're, rec we're not recalling things. We are re rethinking them, I guess is the best way to put it. Yeah, and so this is that's how people work. And this is, this is how I would argue that that works. But having said that, that's a lot of words to get to the exact same place. You know what I mean? Well, it's not actually that. And this is why I think the arguments would kind of go nowhere because it would just be, and I've seen so many girls do this. They'll argue, this is wrong. You guys don't know what you're talking about. Starts running her mouth, running her mouth. And after like three months of talk, she starts like getting right back to the point anyway. I still love seeing that. Chesty and I love making fun of it. It's like, hey, this sounds like some kind of phase a woman has, an epiphany. Oh, that was the one. Yeah, this goofy tw uh, chick tw tweeting about the guys, how they don't think women can learn from their mistakes and... Maybe they're, as they're getting older, they just change who they are fundamentally into like a trad, a traditional conservative woman. And that's just what they've always wanted to be. And she's like, yeah, you guys are all wrong. This is how it happens. So we just kind of laugh. So like, let me get this straight. At about the same time that everybody else starts to get baby rabies, you decide to have an epiphany where you no longer like fun, adventurous sex. And you want to settle down and have a family, bake bread and wear a sundress. Wow. Shine me. Shine me surprised. Did not see that coming. Hey, Allie, speaking of which, Allie, yeah. Now, here's the thing. And, and if you guys think I'm talking about Allie here, no, it's, she's kind of the exception. She actually did it when she was young. So she didn't make the epiphany phase thing. And there's nothing against it. There's nothing wrong with it. Because I think girls miss the point. They got a point that a lot of girls have is, oh, I need to be, I need you to think of me as a good person. Don't invalidate my feelings. A lot of red pill stuff, by the way, is learning how not to invalidate feelings while also not making them real. I think that's the way to put it. What percent of my profit for the stream inspo? <laughs> you can have all 50 cents from this one, madam. Actually, I got a $5 super chat. I send you three fifty in the mail. Yeah, I've broken hearts. I am whamming. No worries. Fun stream. That's good. Intel Wild, $2 super chat. Have you ever met Rolo Real Life or just online? Yeah, of course. Did you not know we've been to that convention that shall not be named twice already? Hung out a bitch. I, I actually, I actually owe him a fishing trip. So yeah. 
Yeah. Like I call him all I call him all the time. We're actually friends in real life. Who to thunk? Who to thunk? Um where was I going with this one? War brides, alpha widows, epiphany phase. Oh, right, right, right. So yeah, you have these big long arguments and they all just end up at the same place. The only difference is how you got there or the backstory behind it, which again, does it really matter? You know what the alpha widow dynamic is and you know what to look for. If you're with a girl and she's pining over another guy, call it alpha widow, move on with your life. That's really the only result. What if you're married and kids? Well, I got a whole thing on dread on that, but chances are if she's not into you, she's not into you because that's another red pilled mental model was... um whispers when he put hypergamy is monogamy which i think is probably the best explanation for hypergamy and how it plays out and why you want it i'm still laughing at guys who call hypergamy a straight jacket or they say hypergamy is like some kind of evil woman gene that like runs through like a parasite or something it's like no man women they're the only reason there's monogamy is because women are hypergamous and all that hypergamy is a woman wants one man at a time her hypergamous best option bam and as soon as she sees that guy she stops seeing other guys as attractive it's like that's my one she's ego invested in it she's attached to it for until she isn't now there's a process that a girl can fall out of love we've talked about the post nut clarity women have a baby with a guy they aren't particularly into uh maybe she's got some borderline personality disorder which is like she falls in love fast falls out fast guy's been slacking for long enough he's fat he's unattractive he's like all the things that make guys attractive you just stop doing them after a while your girl will fall out of love with you it's just how it works free gender that's four cuck articles twenty dollars of heartfelt i think men can't keep sex and relationships separate however women understand it was just having a good time they will even get mad at us saying you loser we were just having sex go find a girlfriend's shoulder to cry on i can't tell if you're shitting on me or not <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i mean they are separate it's really and when we talk about the concept of alpha and beta that's exactly what we're talking about sexual desire anything that's attached to that if it creates and fosters sexual desire it's considered alpha alpha is a big container throw all that stuff in there being tall being aloof dark triad you know all that stuff sexually adventurous emotionally distant tall all that stuff becomes there. And anything that's relationship-ish is beta. You know, he's a good father, protects me, kisses me on the forehead, has a good paycheck, has a good job, gives me orgasms. Yes, orgasms are actually a beta quality. Turns out the alpha quality is just getting her into bed, but keeping her there for the in the morning is a beta one. It's how it happens. <laughs> of course not, but it's a Billy-like super chat. Yeah. I mean, if Billy wants to pay to troll, he's more than welcome to. More more often than not, he just does cheap trolling. What about the dark tent? Oh, what are you talking about, dude? No bringing up nonsense. Hold up a sec. I have a suspicion. Am I right? Yep. Um, oh, so Jackson's here asking, why are orgasms beta? Well, it's because, again, it's like I told you, the whole definition of alpha and beta, sexual desire, relationship comfort. And orgasm, and oh, there's hormones attached to it, too. That's If you've ever seen my series or read the book, Married Man's Sex Life Primer by Athel K, he talks about that. There's hormones that are associated with alpha and beta, and that's how they elicit certain responses. So I'm getting to your question in a long-winded way. Alpha, um, testosterone... Dopamine, endorphins, beta, serotonin, oxytocin. I'm probably missing a few, but that's the gist of it. So when you have an orgasm, it turns out a couple things happen. One, a girl's system floods with dopamine and serotonin. It's, it's the pair bonding hormone. So yeah, and they're like, okay, so, you know, buy your own thing here. The kind of stuff that makes a girl want to stick around and want to be monogamous or all that or want to stay in the relationship happens during the orgasm. All the other stuff, the ang like anxiety, the testosterone, all that stuff happens prior to. So yeah, fucking is alpha, orgasm is beta. 
But you see what I mean? Because a lot of guys think it just means good and bad, and they associate, you know, one's being a simp and the other one is doing something else, and it's just like whatever. They're just they're just tools, and they they achieve different purposes. And if you use too much of one tool when the other one's required, like if you try and hammer shit with a wrench, it's not going to work. A wrench is still a useful tool, but it's not a useful tool for nails. Tomboy, nine dollar ninety nine cent super chat. Thank you very much, sir. But Ryan, doesn't it piss you off that women will be hoes while they're young? And yet, most likely, we'll still settle down with the beta husband once the party years are over. <laughs> well, Michael. <laughs> By the way, and that's the funniest thing. Like, you see a lot of guys are pissed off about that. But that's Michael's story. 100%. I know Zom set me up for this one. I get it. That's the whole point of it. Uh, if you don't know, Michael's story was a comment from an old Dalrock blog of like 2014. And it became its own sidebar thing about some college kid who did everything right and avoided sex and saw all the partying girls and they were talking about the kind of rich, healthy husbands they're going to settle down with. And he's like, try to do that revenge fantasy. You're going to be a hoe when you're long. Nobody's going to love you. And they're like, yeah, we are. And so the whole point of Michael's story is just understand there's no comeuppance. Girls are going to act like promiscuous, slutty women in their 20s. And then they are going to settle down in their late 20s and early 30s and they're going to marry a guy. And that's just... The way it is, they're going to have their cake and they're going to eat it too. And you need to get that hate out of your heart because it's just useless. The lesson isn't, and the lesson isn't even that women or hoes need to accept it. The lesson is there's no just world fallacy. It's because your worldview is shit. Absolutely shit. You're thinking people are supposed to abstain from sex when they're young and only give it up to their best man. Well, it's like nobody does that. Well, yeah, but then they're going to get, then you have to wish ill on them. Well, they have to burn and brimstone and hellfire. Otherwise, I'm wrong and they lived a better life. It's like, oh, so other people need to suffer and get their comeuppance so you can feel better about inventing a story in your head to justify why you're not having fun in your 20s. I understand it now. Sleeper, $5 one Australian super chat. Thank you very much. So how often do you think of the Roman Empire? <laughs> Love your work. <laughs> All right, in fairness, my girl did ask me about that. How often do you think of the Roman Empire? I'm like, not much. And I think it's the Roman Republic that you're supposed to think about, not the Roman Empire. And then I brought up, somebody was tweeting about the reason. There's really three reasons why guys think it's fascinating. One, lasted for 2,000 years. Two, every Western European culture we have right now considers themselves descendants of the Romans. And three, they wrote everything down. So there is like a large body of knowledge from it. And that's why people tend to like the Roman Empire. Like I said, for me, World War One was my thing. I liked that one. Uh, oh, hey, green lights. Good to see you, sir. Hopefully you're smoking meat right now. I think at that time we crawled out of the ocean all the time. Dude, Rob, in fairness, a lot of people need to walk back into the fucking ocean. I really, I really mean that. Uh, free gender, $2 super chat. Explain settling down to Har Steve Harvey. <laughs> oh, what happened? Yeah, it was his thing. His wife fucked the, uh, fucked the bodyguard, right? I never really followed it, and I know Rolo did a thing. I never watched it, so I'm like, ah, I, I I know this gimmick. But it was yeah, he's just been simping his whole life, and then again, just world fallacy, watching his girl get railed by the help. It's like, oh okay, that's it. Space race was my thing. I can see that working too. Party guard, chef, pool boy, yeah, and that's why everybody loves these things. They're so compelling because it's stuff that goes against their worldview. It's a it's a comeuppance thing. Oh my God, Steve Harvey did all the things you're supposed to do and bad things still happen. People want to watch. Like, oh my God. Not realizing that, you know, women have a resurgence. She's done all the things she needed to do. She raised a family. She got the tie to her husband, had the money, all that. And now she wants to go have fun. And Steve was probably very traditional. It's like, no, no, no. We're going to call each other mom and pa and shit. And she's like, no, I'm just going to fuck the pool boy. It happens. Yeah, missed last week was picking up my side of beef in Wyoming. Dude, what an empty state Wyoming is. I drove through it. I didn't even know it was Wyoming until there was an accident at the side of the road. And we all had to pull over for a bit, wait for the cops to clear it off. And I'm like, where are we? And somebody's like, oh, you're in Wyoming. I was like, oh, damn. Pull up the phone. I'm like, holy shit. Wyoming was just like, it's just empty, flat plains. It's crazy. It's not like the East Coast where everything you get past the, the Mason-Dixie line, it's all cornfields. But Wyoming wasn't even that. They can't grow corn. And then Hugh Jackman. Oh, yeah, the Hugh Jackman one, too. See, now, here's the other thing. 
everybody, it's kind of like an open secret that Hugh Jackman was a beard. And if you don't know what a beard is, it's a gay guy who gets married to a girl for appearances. So their separation is like, eh, really? Probably not. It's mostly federal land. Oh, that's probably why. The speed limit is 80? Eight, oh, 80 miles. Yeah, that makes more sense. Sorry, in Canada, when you say 80, that's like slower than highway driving. Highway driving is usually 90. 60,000, 600,000 people? Really? I think I met all of them that day. Just driving by their houses. Hey, how's it going? Hey, Ryan. Uh, All right, let's do some... I got to pay the bills here. Thank you for the super chats. Watch a commercial. I've transformed. I'm charming. I'm good looking and in shape, but bored. I need something to do next. Another challenge to conquer. Please give it to me. And, th and you know what? Speaking of the Roman Empire thing, here's where it's kind of applicable here. I don't get why people aren't more curious about this stuff. Really. I mean, think of, imagine being your like Roman Empire buff, looking up Roman history, and it's applicable to you day to day. Like that's an extra level of interest. You should be able to easily see, like, you know, a shit post about vasectomies. You're like, oh, it's stupid. And then you rubber neck, you go look in. You find the Rational Mail, read his first, uh, first year blog. And you're like, oh, this is interesting. And then you find out about Roy Seeks. He links some stuff in, like, his article about Alpha Buddha. So you find Chateau Hartis. And you're like, oh, man, this is amazing, too. Then you're reading the Chateau Hartis stuff. And then you find out about Roos's stuff. And then you find yourself on the subreddit. And you're like, oh, you find Glover. And it's like, every time you read something, it's like, oh, it's either... That's something I do, and that guy solved it by doing this. I'm going to try that. Oh, fuck, it works. Or that is something I've known, but I didn't know anybody else knew. And it's finally, like, the way he explained it makes perfect sense. You know, a way of understanding things. Or, at the very least, just sometimes it's just interesting. Like, no offense to, to everybody else here, but Royce really was one of the best, one of the best authors. With some of his articles, I know, they're just funny. Just funny. And they're good, and they're entertaining. <laughs> just saw the ad take my money couch don't even need the product oh thank you very much sir thank you very much yeah and but guys just don't seem to care they were like i just want to watch uh jedida bila and ruslan yell at rollo and they're french fragile people too fuck jesus that's the other reason why do you not want to do this stuff why do you just want to watch the blood sport this blood sport is maybe that's the appeal is watching emotionally fragile children yelling at each other like, though, I'm slowly starting to learn who people are. Like, when I ask what a Zerka is, I, I, I ask what a Ruslan is. I know what a Ruslan is now. He doesn't like me. <laughs> Which I'm not... I mean, to be fair, I did kind of earn that. Um, and the, the Angela Knight, the chubby Asian girl with the criminal record. And you watch it, and they're just like petulant teenagers yelling at dad. All of them. And it's like, no wonder Rolo's just like, you know what? I'm just leaning into this. I'm going to be the Axel Rose in the Manosphere. Fuck it. You know, pre-Chinese revolution or whatever they called it chinese democracy yeah it's like watching a train wreck and i get that it gets bored so fast though and there's so much better train wrecks dude the logan paul having everybody call his wife a whore and then i'll i'll take it out on him in the ring if you're gonna watch a train wreck at least that one's entertaining there's production value in it as opposed to now where it's like tate teaches you about fatherhood which, oh, funniest thing, by the way, I don't remember who it was. I got to go check the comments again. But it was the funniest thing one of you guys did where apparently he's on, he has one of his quotes. It's like having a daughter is, is functionally useless. And I was just laughing now. Now that he's using his daughter. I'm assuming it's his daughter. Maybe he paid an actress. I don't know. Now he's using his daughter to try and whitewash his, his career. So he looks like a good dad. <laughs> and I was like, well, I guess he found a use for his kid after all. You need to keep daddy out of slab jail, hun. Thank you. There's no such thing as a Wyoming. Don't believe the lies. Wyoming truthers in the chat. Uh, free gender, $2 super chat. How much for a signed copy of your book? Um, I'll probably, if you have one, just I'll sign it. But it's a matter of us getting somewhere together. I, I tried it for a bit there where I like charged a thing. I signed a copy and mailed it out. It was just logistically, it was such a pain in the ass that like until I can get to the point where I can hire somebody to do all of that administrative stuff for me, it's just not worth so I guess the easiest way to do that is just be an editor and I'll send you a signed copy. Or if you ever meet me at an event or a thing that I'm doing, 
I'll usually bring a bunch with me, or if you have one there, I'll sign it there, and that's fine. Or be delicious tacos. He and I have swapped uh, signed copies of the books. It was pretty good. It's probably one of my favorites. Although he drew like a fully naked clam staring at you at the at his where there's like, yeah, keep kicking ass, Ryan. I'm like, thanks, man. All right, the Tate Stedman Paternal Power Hour. Oh yeah, it's just really it's just ridiculous. Go to the Ryan meetup in Toronto. <laughs> Do I ever leave Canada? I try. Dude, I want to. I, I used to travel all the time. I've been doing nothing but traveling most of my life. It's just lately, after COVID, they just... Flying isn't fun anymore, and so I just don't like doing it. I, I always hated American airports. You guys are, like, herding cattle in there. It's not a pleasurable experience, and... It's just now in Canada, everybody just stopped trying. Nobody cares. Nobody does their job anymore. The whole experience of flying is just ridiculous, and so I'm just like, I'm just not flying anymore. I mean, I maybe fly for work, but it doesn't really pay enough for me to go take a whole flight somewhere. So I'm like, no, no, no. Because like, I was talking with Rolo about this one, and I asked, because you, you've obviously seen all the Bloodsport stuff he does, the the Access Vegas. Oh, actually, that's a bad example. It was the a sauce cast, uh, Fresh and Fit, and the yelling at people, and the debates, and all that shit, right? And I kind of asked, I'm like, how, how well does all of this stuff do? Like what, what is the, what is the ROI on this clown show? And he goes, you know what? Not much. So this is the secret for you guys. It doesn't, this kind of shit doesn't boost your book sales. This kind of shit doesn't bring in crazy amounts of ad revenue. It doesn't bring in awesome super chats. If you're going with somebody else to collab, like fresh and fit, oh, everything to Rolo. They would have been nothing, except for he came there and gave them their initial boost with his clout. It's good for them. I guess you could argue I kind of did the same thing, but whatever. I'm not here to shit on them for that, because I'm doing it too. <laughs> no, uh, but the point is then, it's like they don't... He'd have to pay for his own flights. They wouldn't pay him for speaking events. People are like stiffing him out of money when he goes to speaking events and shit like that. And it's just like, why would you do all this stuff if it doesn't increase your income? Like, it's not fun doesn't increase your income so that's why i don't fly if somebody's willing to pay me the cost of a flight ticket plus something that's worth my time to go do something somewhere else i'll probably go do it but i'm not just going to go for the sake of doing it canada is becoming the u.s or is it the other way around canada is a weird it's we're becoming britain is what we're becoming it's very weird yeah it's pure clout that's just it clout the fuck is clout like we all say it but have you ever thought about what is clout Random people online liking you and knowing who you are and thinking fondly of you. That's clout. It's the validation of random internet assholes. And I was just like, what a horrible, horrible thing. And I think everybody has the same idea. Yeah, all money up front, Donnie. Exactly. I think one of the most horrible things is when people treat it the same way they used to treat startups in like 2004. Where they build a company... They don't care about profitability. They don't care about anything that makes a business a business. Their exit strategy is build something good enough that Google buys them out. And that's the whole plan. And I think that's what the cloud thing is. People fight for the attention and the affection and the adoration of as many random internet assholes as possible in hopes that somebody with money can say, hey, I want you to sell Raid Shadow Legends. Can you do that? You're like, yeah. And then they'll finally get their paycheck. Google bought me. In a sense, they're they're the ones that should be worrying about AI. Like, you know those ones where the new AI bots are coming out and talking like a person and acting like a person and stealing the voice? Because when you see these people, they got management companies that deal with them. They give them 20% of their income, and the management people tell them how to do their brand. So you're not talking to a person. You're talking to a management group with the person as like an AI thing. It's the original, the original what do they call those things? Oh, who here is a nerd? Do you remember those YouTube videos and Twitch streams where it's like an AI anime chick? But it's somebody else behind the scenes doing all the acting. I can't remember what the hell those are. Yeah, whatever. It doesn't matter. Anyways. Hi, I'm Chest Rockwell, and I'm here to tell you about the bald toner from Manscaped. Yeah. Anybody that talks for a living better get some skill. Well, yeah. We could talk about skill and stuff. VTubers. Thank you. VTubers. That's exactly what I was talking about. 
Destiny is a VTuber. That uh, Erudite, VTuber. Every other one. Who else do I shit on? They're all VTubers, though. They all have management teams telling them shit. I'm sorry, wrong type of nerd. I helped make the AI. Fair enough. Copyzilla did a vid on podcast scams. Yeah, bread tubers, all of them. Vouch, same thing. So you're not actually talking to a person. You're talking to a brand. Somebody's actually decided, I'm going to literally sell my soul to the devil for money. The devil in this case is the marketing firm, three parentheses. <laughs> oh, that Aussie Spurg uses the software, some vampire dude. Yeah, all those guys too. It's the same thing. That's kind of why I like being small. I would hate if I ever got to be like a couple hundred thousand people on the various platforms and that because like, see, I can still read when you guys are talking. I can see it all. I may not respond to all of it, but I can read it all. And if it's particularly interesting or it's a super chat, I'll fucking bring in as part of the stream. We do it together. If we ever got that big, I couldn't do that. I would have to like think, what does the branding mean? And it's, it's always been the running joke that this channel has been criminally underrated. And that's kind of why, because if, if I want to grow, I have to basically pander. And I don't, I don't think that would work with red pill as a content. Cause the whole point of this is at the point of origin, right? Swapping notes with men, positive male identity, knowing what you want, not letting the outside world manipulate you unless they pay you full price for the goods. Can't really get there if all I'm doing is giving you guys an example of pandering. It's, I was bit, that's always been my biggest problem with like uh, Tate and uh, Crescent. I see your super channel get there in a sec with like the Tate and the Destiny on oh, Fresh and Fit and all these guys. It's that you guys say the right words, but your actions don't line up at all. Like you can't talk to me about being a high value man when you're like leveraging blowjobs to get on the fucking podcast. You can't. You just can't. It's like a dis disingenuous. What's the word I'm looking for? I'll just say disingenuous and leave it at that. It's contradictory, conflicting, disingenuous. And so when the person's watching this, they don't know they're picking up on the subtext, but they are. And that's how you get guys who like think of themselves as alpha males, but completely act like douchebags or retards or completely unattractive nerds. And that's because the subtext teaches you more than you think. Uh, Crescent Slice, $4.99 chat. I should have to say Crescent Slice because he's got an exclamation mark. What do you mean by Destiny is a v VTuber? Can you expand on that? Oh, yeah. It's e so all of these guys, and I've talked behind the scenes with some people who are in the know, and it's, yeah, like I'll use Destiny as an example here because fuck that guy. Um, he has a management team. The management team goes on and tells him, okay, do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this. Don't fuck up like this. Don't fuck up like this. This is how you deal with this. Essentially, how to run your brand. What to say, what not to say, all that stuff, right? So he's not coming out and being, and I, I'm jokingly, his authentic self. Essentially, he's not being sincere. This is not, I don't even know what the fuck his name is, which should kind of let you know. It's not even his real name. It's not even a name. It's Destiny. It's a video game. So he's going out there. Saying what his management team says is good to say. Talking about things that it's not that he has. Do you think he gives a shit about the manosphere? No, of course not. Do you think he gives a shit about the red pill? No. He just knows that Myron's hot right now. And so if he sits on there and bitches and moans and argues, like why Myron had him on, I'll never know. Isn't his whole thing about having alpha males on there talking about them hoes? Brings on what is arguably the least potentially alpha male looking character I've ever seen. Like his only, his only game is sneaky fucker. And he has drugs. That's it. Which, not shouting down, like, game is game. But you gotta admit, if you're giving guys a pathway to success, you could do a lot better. Probably the same agency repping Jordan Peterson. Yeah, Jordan Peterson, another good example. You literally can see it. Hey, what's up, Torsha? Ryan's our last hope. I hope. I God, I hope not. I hope not. If I'm the last hope, we're more fucked than I thought. <laughs> um, yeah, Peterson. So you used to watch his, I know most people, you couldn't watch a YouTube video. If you left autoplay on after the third video, it's always a Jordan Peterson lecture. That's like the rule of YouTube. Um, so yeah, you were watching him talk about this stuff and him going out and doing his thing. He was very sincere, very honest. You know, he didn't like getting bullied, shit like that. But then after, I think it was right around the time at the, so what you're saying is the Nancy thing. 
he got a team out of LA. I can't remember the name of it. He, he mentioned it once, but there's the some management team. And then once that happened, he just kind of neutered him. You could tell he had talking points now. He had a script to stick to. And now when you see him on Daily Wire, it's the same thing. It's like, it's just babble. And it's, I just don't like this management team thing. I get it from a brand perspective. It prevents you from making, you know, silly, stupid mistakes, which we're human beings. You're going to make some and it's okay to own that. You know, I've had my own examples. I always use the example with Chrissy Mayer when she found the old uh, dread article that I had taken from the blue pill professor and put it up where he was talking about his levels of dread and like nuclear dread and how to cheat on your wife. And it was like, it was cringe, but I'm like, you know what? Like, Tried it, didn't work, threw it away. It's there for posterity, whatever. But that's the point. It's not a screw up. It's how you got here. And you, nobody can fault you for it. It happened. You, you're going to tell me what di happened didn't happen? It's like, no, man. It'll be fine. But I guess a lot of guys just make this decision. They would rather pay somebody to teach them how to be a authentic human being online. And that's... How is that functionally different than a VTuber? How is that functionally different? It's not. Do people actually, are you like enjoying that? I don't enjoy it. I don't want to have, I think it's like the same thing as when you see reality TV and you find out it's all scripted anyway and changed in the edits. You're like, so it's not reality. It's the fiction of reality. It's a, it's cheaper acting. It's Mexican telenovelas, which I guess is fine. But then it's the, it's the fact that people try to pretend that it's not. Which I guess makes it kayfabe. And that's why kayfabe is such a strong red-pilled concept. Why it applies in marriages. Why it applies in sex and relationships. And God knows it's why most people that have been red-pilled end up being fairly media savvy. Like you may remember Tucker Max, Cernovich, um, Ryan Holiday, these guys. Yeah, they were kind of all around. Jack Murphy, Royce in DC, or Roosh and all them, all the DC pickup scene. All these guys were part of the same club. Is it any wonder now that they're like the best internet marketers that you see out there some, or some of the best? Of course it is. It's because these same rules apply because the red pill is almost, it's a way of navigating the human condition. So what is marketing and advertising if not navigating the human condition? You know? Yeah. Peterson burnt out, then only came back because the money was too good to say no. Can't blame him. Oh, don't get me wrong. Yeah, reality-ish. Exactly, Nick. Sluggo's absolutely right. And don't get me wrong, I have no animosity about it. I'm like, good for you, man. Jordan Peterson gave his audience everything. He got thrust into fame when he wasn't ready for it. He didn't want it. They gave it to him anyway. And then he saw this horrible, painful group of guys that were like, oh my God, they're such suffering. I can help. I'm going to do my best, do what I can for them. And they fucking ruined him for it. They ruined him. And then afterwards, they're sitting there and they have the balls to say, our dad let us down. He got addicted to Benzies. His daughter's a whore. Fuck this guy. And if I was him, I'd be like, fuck you guys too. Honey, take my Twitter account. I'm going to take this $8 million a year at Daily Wire. And I'm going to sit here giving out platitudes for the rest of my life. Fuck these incels. They can go die for all I care. I'm, I'm really hoping that that's how that conversation, that negotiation went down. Cause that's what I would be like too. It's also why, again, stop trying to red pill your friends. Stop trying to red pill your audience. Jordan's net worth is insanely high still now. Oh yeah. Like, don't get me wrong. Remember that when it was a big deal that he canceled his Patreon that was earning uh, $20,000 a month, $20,000 a month. And then he was earning 50,000 in book sales. So he's like a hundred thousand dollars a month. He was earning and he just stopped. He's like, yeah, throw all that away. Why? Oh, Making $8 million a year at the Daily Wire. I don't know how that place makes money, by the way. I have never seen anything from Daily Wire other than links you guys send me. Or research to make fun of Matt Walsh. How is that place making money? Is it is it baller? Yeah. Fame was supposed to be an experiment, I thought. Well, I mean, it still kind of is. Uh, so the stripper says, most think Red Pill's a philosophy or group. Those that have around, think of as a library. Yeah, I'd say a library is probably the best way to describe it. Just a whole bunch of napkins with like lipstick notes written on them. Okay, Zomboy, $4.99 super chat. Ryan, why doesn't Rolo like Jeffrey Miller? I've read his book, The Mate, and it's pretty red pill as far as I can tell. Oh, Statler and Waldorf, eh? Yeah. Dude, their beef, I find their beef absolutely hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. They have no reason they should be fighting. 
but they do. Like, Rolo even knows them. I think Rolo and uh, Jeff Miller's wife are, are buddies from the evil psych days and that, which is fine. It's really about the it's really about the Polly thing. That's it. Um, he loves Jeff Miller's work. He likes the idea of evil psych as a practice. In that sense, he and Jeff look eye to eye on everything. But then he's like, and then he goes and ignores all of his research for the the Polly thing, and then he tells other people to do Polly and shit like that, which. I don't know, whatever. He's not wrong. It is a bit disingenuous. Steven Pinker has got the same attitude of that where I've never seen somebody ignore the, the the results of their own research so hard as that guy. Anyway, so now they they basically have been sniping at each other for years. Um, Miller, I'm pretty sure, doesn't like Rolo because he doesn't like the idea of this armchair rock star doing all the Evo psych work when he's like, I'm a serious scientist and I do serious work and this Yahoo's getting all the glory. This is ridiculous. And so I think it's it's kind of there. It, I, I find it funny. It's it's beef It's beef that I can get behind. I think Miller and I follow each other. We've talked every now and again. We've had a couple spats behind the scenes, but, you know. At the end of this, The Mating Mind, it's a good book. It does really good. It's not on the red-pilled canon list. I suppose I could make a play to add it, but I have to finish it first. I've got so many books I've got to get through, and that's not even... So once the mids watches are done, I was planning on like starting to read all the Manosphere books and give like reviews on them on the channel. I haven't even gotten there yet, man. Uh, Crescent Slice, another $4.99 chance or super chat. With all of Destiny's fuckery, you would think his team would keep him in check. That's why it's hard to believe that he has a team. Honestly, I, I, I don't know if what he's doing is bad. Like what are the consequences? He can't get fired. I'm positive he's got a rich dad. He's like bash that, bash that way. So he doesn't need the money. And I have a feeling they're like, yeah, just go with it. It's fine. I, I have a feeling they are egging him on for this stuff. Because other than getting people riled up, he's almost like Roddy Piper. Except for not charismatic, not fun, and can't wrestle. But he's got... Because P- Piper was the greatest heel in wrestling. And everybody's like, Ric Flair. Like, no, Piper. Piper got stabbed four times. That's how much he got his audience riled up in his lifetime. People got so mad at him as a heel in wrestling that they stabbed him with a knife in the stomach more than once. Nobody can say, how do you drum up hate like that? He does it. And he did some shit too. He did blackface. He cracked a coconut over Jimmy Snuka's forehead. Like all the things you could possibly do to piss people off. And so I was, I'd argue Take away the charm, the charisma, and just keep the the asshole fuckery. And that's kind of like Destiny's gimmick right now. Which I feel bad saying this because I'm a huge Piper fan. He's easily my top three. Piper, Bret Hart, and Hulk Hogan, Ultimate Warrior. I'd say top four. Uh, Jeff is part of a group of guys who don't connect the dots of their data intentionally. Yeah, exactly. I think that's the part that Rolo doesn't like. But for me, I don't mind. I don't. That part doesn't, I don't care. Because I don't think a good thing about this red pill stuff is having figureheads or brands or ass models. We don't need any of this shit. Ideally, I would love it if it was just like random asshole number 17 on the camera. If I didn't go IRL right at the beginning, I probably would still be anonymous on this thing. So that was a choice that was kind of made for me. But yeah, so I mean, the dots are there just because he personally doesn't connect them doesn't mean anything. But that's the point. If everybody's going to focus on him being Polly, why don't they just focus on his work? Well, he's not living by his own work. Well, a lot of people suck. What do you want me to say? Uh, Chuck Royale, $9.99 Super Chat. Thank you very much, sir. Rolo was my red-pilled intro, but not loving having to Google these grifters to get through his show lately. Thanks for staying critically undervalued, Couch. Oh, dude. You have no idea how many times he's been sitting here, like, we'll talk about something. He's, like, ranting about somebody like yeah this person and this person and this person they're so far and i'm like who are any of these people how do you find these people it's like every week there was like a it was like highlander remember highlander the tv series every week there was a new villain he had to chop the head off it's like that with rollo every week there's a brand new million subscriber grifter somewhere that's that's shitting all over him and trying to take him down and i'm like where do these people come from is there a factory somewhere is there some kind of like Pat Stedman factory where grifters just keep coming out of the woodwork with these gigantic accounts? They're all bigger than me. 
Never heard of a single one of them. I don't know. Dark Knight Dev, $5.69 Super Chat. Ryan, what is your definition of charm and how it applies in social interactions such as pickup or friends and family? Charm? I've never actually had to define it, but charm? Charm is the pleasant aftertaste people get after dealing with you. I, I think that's a pretty accurate way of putting it. Charm doesn't necessarily mean good. You can be, you know, an absolute dick and still be charming about it. It's just, it's a nice aftertaste. It's like, oh yeah, I was dealing with that guy. There's something to it. It's like, it's engaging. It's, it's, it's pleasant, even when it's not. As far as how it applies in social interactions, dude, it's the halo effect. When you're charming, people want to be around you. People want to spend time with you. People enjoy the time they do have with you. People fight for your attention. That's charm is anything that's good and whole and 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 beneficial about human interaction. Now, like, am I a good orator? I don't know. But if I can if I can sit here and string a sentence together, if I can smile when I do it, if I can clap my hands and get you guys thinking, yeah, he I was fucking thinking it, he was saying it. He was saying it. That's a little bit of charm. That'll get you to stick here and watch a video. If it's friends and family, yeah, charm is how you can yell at your mom on Christmas and then go have dinner together and she still loves you forever. Charm is how you can get into that girl's pants who's like, I didn't really want to sleep with him, but when he opened his mouth, it just fucking panties just fell off. Charm is how you can tell somebody to go fuck them. Charm is how Chesty can go to a judge and explain some stuff and the judge doesn't tell him to piss off. Charm is charisma. It's everything you want. It's that sweet aftertaste you get after just a mouthful of whatever the fuck you're feeding people. I love it. <laughs> there can only be one. <laughs> yeah. And it's not necessarily feeling good either. Like I said, there's a lot of charming assholes. Like uh, if you've ever been in the military, there's always like crusty old chiefs and they just yell on the screen. There was chiefs. I remember what was this guy? Wiggins. I can talk about him now. He's dead, which is weird. He was like 50. Um, Chief Wiggins. Horrible guy. I remember his his lore ran deep. So he was part of a cocaine smuggling ring in the military. And one of them got, they all got caught. And he ratted them all out and they all went to jail and then he got a promotion. So it's like, this is the kind of guy you're dealing with. He's kind of like, he reminds me of, you remember Tourette's guy? Kind of like that, but more hair. And then at one point he was the chief of the barracks and he was fucking one of the students or the brand new ordinary seaman in the bathroom. And when the duty watch caught him when they were doing the rounds, he threatened to kill them if they said anything. And then this guy somehow still managed to make a chief first class, like the top rank of the non-commissioned officer. It was the most amazing thing. Anyways, everybody hated him. He was a giant asshole. My first experience with him was getting dressed down when I didn't even know who he was. I'm like... There's nothing worse than when somebody's dressing you down in civilian clothes and you're like, fuck, do I, is this an officer? Is this a chief? Or is this an asshole? Do I, and you're like, I don't even know how to respond to this, but you're on base. So you kind of like play it cautious. You're like, do I call you chief or sir? Call me chief. I'm like, oh, okay, good. <laughs> All right. Yes, chief. Yes, chief. Yeah, I'm right here, chief. Thank you, chief. Then you go to work. Did you just get yelled at by Wiggins? Say, yeah, he got Wigganed. I guess that was a thing. Uh, where was I going with this? One? Oh, yeah. But the point was, he was a giant asshole, an absolute prick, a dirtbag in every sense of the word. But every time you had an interaction with Chief Wiggins, everybody had a good laugh. You hated it. You were terrified. But everybody had a good laugh. So he had some charm to it, right? And I still remember the last story I ever heard of him. This is off topic, but it's just so good. I have to tell it. I, I don't want to have the second time he dies be when the last time somebody mentions his name. So he, um, there's this Admiral's Road. That's the, the street that you leave the, the military base in, in Victoria. And there's always traffic there because all the military guys are leaving at the same time. It's just a small country road, right? So he's walking and going across the street. We were doing a watch at uh, the radio station at the time. So we, we were just getting in. He was getting out. We're all there doing, one of the guys comes in. Guys, I just saw somebody try to kill Wiggins. And we're just like, oh, fuck. Turns out, so he was walking across the street and somebody had pulled in too close to the crosswalk. And Wiggins looks over. He sees the taper-trimmed haircut, the cut hair. I thought it was another military guy. So he's like, I'm going to pull my chief shit. He fucking bangs on his hood. 
It's a fucking walk signal. Starts dressing the guy down. Turns out, guy was just some guy. He was just a civilian. He just happened to have a really high and tight haircut. So gets out of his truck. He's huge. Huge, man. Doesn't know who the fuck Bobby Wiggins is. Goes to beat the shit out of him. And Wiggins has to run. And he's got... Uh, he's, so he's like chasing this chief down the street. <laughs> <laughs> and because everybody in the lineup was military and they all knew who he was and they all saw this, it was like nobody even cared that this guy was blocking traffic now because they wanted like I have been here my entire 20 year career for this moment to watch somebody pop Wiggins in the mouth. <laughs> One of our guys comes in, you guys, you'll never meet. He's telling us this story and we're all having a good laugh. So like even he had some charm, you know, anyways. Who was the guy that called you ordinary? Oh, everybody did. That was my rank when I first got in. That's everybody's rank. So Canadian military ranks, there's ordinary seaman. And then you finish your, or after you finish your QL3 package, you're ordinary seaman trained. And then after your JL4s, you got your able seaman. And then once you do your four and a half years or advanced promotion to three and a half, you get what's called a leading seaman. And then you get merit listed. And if you get onto the promotions, it's master seaman. And then it's petty officer second class. And this is the non-commissioned officer ranks. Petty officer second class, then petty officer first class, where you become a uh, head of department, a uh, chief petty officer second class, where you could be like a uh, a boat uh, chief bosun's mate or two IC for things, and then you have your chief petty officer first class, where you're your coxswain or your base um, army equivalent is like a regiment regiment sergeant major, RSM. I don't know what the American equivalent is, but it's like the top rank. Anyways, Dark Knight Dev, two dollars Italian restaurant in the six called Mama Martino. Mama Martino? And what's the six? Oh, wait. No, that's the that's Toronto. I keep forgetting about that. Drake always calls Toronto the six, and the joke is because there's six boroughs, but um I always make the joke because all the women's here are all the women here are mids. On the Queensway. Do I know this one? Where in the fuck is this? On the Gartner. Oh, it's almost on Etobicoke. I think I've eaten here, actually. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I know this place. What What about it? Italian restaurant in the six called Mama Martino. Oh, it's good. Yeah. I haven't actually eaten here, but we've wanted to. I've heard everybody talks about it like it's like the Italian place. It's like it's like some shitty 80s looking thing, but. Uh... That's funny. Holy shit, man. Yeah, I've driven by that place. It's that big sign that always gets you. Dougie's stomping ground. Oh. Is that where he does the crack? Hey, Ryan, what's your notch count? Uh, my notch count is three. I've had three, and that's all you're ever going to hear. <laughs> now, uh, Ishan, if you really should, you should just ask. Like, uh, my book, I talk about that. I lost count. It was literally the first chapter of Fuck Files. I was talking about the story where my buddy and I were picking up these two chicks and the one chick, like, halfway through the set was like, you realize we've had sex already, right? And it was like an epiphany for me. And I realized, like, I always thought, you know, I can remember all the girls. I remember all the names. I keep my notch count in my head because it was like a point of pride. And it was, that's why I'm a good person. Like, I'm better than, you know, him. He just sleeps with girls and throws them away. And then I realized, like, there's a whole girl I completely forgot about. And there's no way she's the only one. And so I had an epiphany at that point, realizing it really doesn't matter about chasing notches. So yeah, that was the whole point, is uh, sleep with enough women to the point where you'd realize it's not as important as you think, and then you kind of try to find what you value. It's a really undervalued thing about frame. Oh, I meant the one from your scrubbing toilet story. That was uh, Hannum. Hannum. He was uh, he was a naval communicator. Uh, Wiggins, he was a bosun, so that's different. And he was a P2. He wasn't a chief. All right, where are we at here? My semen is extraordinary. First off, it's not sea men, it's sea man, like a man of the sea, not semen as in jizz. That's a lame joke, and you guys should really do better. Uh, Antler is a really good place if you haven't been. All game, small place, great food. Antler? Antler, kitchen and bar. I saw Dundas, Trinity Bellwoods. Holy shit, dude. You know, I live like right downtown, right? That to me, you're talking about at the edge of town. That's like, you might as well have it on Mars if you're going on Dufferin. <laughs> Although that one does look familiar. 
Oh, no, wait. I've eaten here. I have eaten here. I have been to Antler. My girl took me there once. We had one of them bowls. I laugh because if this is the place that I'm thinking, they have a bathroom. And I was showing it to me. just laughing. I'm like, bro, they have like a, a watering can in the bathroom, which anybody here who's Middle Eastern or Indian will know exactly why I'm laughing as soon as I saw it. It was one of those things when I went to Oman the first time, I kept seeing watering cans in the in the toilets. I'm like, what the hell is this? And somebody finally explained to me why they're there. And I'm like, oh. And so now I just have this joke. There's this high-end, posh, hipster restaurant, the watering can in the fucking bathroom. <laughs> How does it not make you laugh? Uh, there's a joke about camels being the ships of the desert, right? Something about seaman, probably. Yeah, look at the chat bringing value to the coach. Thank you very much, sirs. I had a bottle of wine last night, so I didn't have a full lesson plan here. I just kind of wanted to, I just wanted to riff more. A little crowd service. I don't do that enough with you guys. You really are a good audience. Like, you'll watch the things that I put out, and I'll make sure to put out the best that I can. It's a small group, but you're goddamn great. I see watery bottles in all the truck stop bathrooms. <laughs> yeah, so that's like uh, bidets for people who don't have indoor plumbing. Anyways. Let's get back to the red pill stuff. Let me throw another. Single moms, a horrible position that's not my problem. Hey, uh, you sir, severely underrated. I like how you distill red pill concept into simple, pragmatic and functional stuff. You know what's fun though? That's, that's the whole point of it. And I'd argue that most of the stuff is meant to be simple, pragmatic and functional. When you see people talking and they try to make things overly complex and sound extremely smart, they A, they don't know what they're talking about. Because if you can't simplify something, you don't understand it. And B, they don't actually want to teach. I'm not about, like, you don't have to learn, but I'm going to teach. If those people, they just want you to love them. They want you to think they're very smart. And I can't remember who it is. Somebody said it was a really good thing, like a good... A good content creator sounds smart. A really good content creator makes you feel smart. Makes you feel smart. Not him. I hate you just a little bit. Ah, that's fine. I'm surprised it's just a little bit. I've been a pretty big dick for like the last four years. Uh, Jack, Torsha, the stream you two had me cracking up. Oh, I got to watch that one. It's on my list. <laughs> it's on my list. Anyways, um, yeah, the simple practical stuff. Most of it is practical. Now, don't get me wrong. It was it was a lot of words used over the years to get there, but it was never about trying to make things sound overly complicated. It was more people were processing something and finding which narrative best encapsulated a lesson, a mental model, a field report, you know? I just like your vids and turn them into audio. <laughs> yeah, be attractive, don't be unattractive. To be fair, that's not even a red pill thing. That's a pickup thing. Pickup artists always said that because like so many guys were doing things that were just extremely unattractive and they were afraid to do things that made them more attractive and they still were like wondering why they weren't successful. And I'm just like, exactly. <laughs> Master debater. <laughs> yeah. And so about frame, I think actually there was a mids watch I just did too. It's a good example of this, what we're talking about. Jack was talking to somebody else. And he's like, I want you to like define a Walt. All women are like that, the mental model. Can anybody do it? Has there ever been one? This was seven years ago. I'd argue we're still no closer today to having a, a, a concise definition of AWALT. It is a pretty big container word. It's just, it's essentially saying, whammon, am I right? Anything that a woman does that's, that's very stereotypically woman is all women are like that. And that's why I'm very flippant with like those people like, well, AWALT is about this and this. like, relax. AWALT is just a way for you to understand. Don't take things personally. Women are just going to be women. All women are like that. Well, mine's not like that. All guns are loaded, man. It's not about the actual gun being loaded. It's about you having the right information to make a better choice. So if you hear like, oh, she cheated on me with the drug dealer boyfriend. I'm Steve Harvey. And you're like, oh, all women are like that. He goes, all right, fair enough. It's a way of like getting over something, getting through something and not holding women to a standard that they can't possibly match up to, you know? So yeah, AWALT. Is it actually true? Are all women actually like that? Well, no. Like, stop with the autism, madam. I don't need this shit. If I wanted to have somebody argue about Minuche all the time, I would 
fucking follow Kate. Uh, Paul, oh, $9.99 super chat. I have been watching way too much of your stuff. Met this Navy chick last night. We were talking in bed and she mentions doing this watch at 12 a few days ago. First thing came to mind was the mids watch. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Yeah, she had a mids. She had a mids watch. That's literally it. If you guys don't know, the mids watch is actually from, it's, it's the term came from the midnight to eight o'clock watch or the six till six, six in the evening till six in the morning watch in the military. It's called the mids watch or mids. And I always liked it because that was the vibe I was trying to get with it. And that's why somebody else asked really early on, like an hour ago about why do you always have that lo-fi music in the background for your mids watch ones? And that's why, because I remember that it's like midnight. I was grabbing another degree from school. I was writing and I had to sit there and watch the, the, uh, what the hell's the right side of the room? There's the radio stuff on this side and there's the network stuff on this side. It was on the network side. So the lights are all out. You just have like a lamp that you turn upside down for some ambient lighting. You'd have like CBC Radio 3 playing with like all those like jazzy tunes and that. And you just sit there quietly getting your work done. It was like a, it was a wonderful vibe. And I tried to recreate that for the Mids Watch ones. So yeah. And then I'm like, I'll just call it the Mids Watch because that's exactly what it was. It was the same vibe I had for the Mids Watch. Yeah, it's a great vibe. Of course she was, Marty. Oh, was she a mid doing a mids watch? Well, I mean, she was a sailor. <laughs> Military broads, am I right? I guess that's the big question, Paul. You met this Navy chick. You try to fool around with a Navy girl? You don't want that. You don't want none of that smoke, sir. I've dated three military girls in my life, and that's it. Never again. And I, I learned my lesson after the first one. I was just stupid for the next two. But, I mean, in my in my defense... She did have a boob job, and so I had to know for myself. I'm like, you know what? I need to get that under my bucket list. And then I got it out. I'm like, eh. 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 Some people like artificial sweetener. Some people like sugar. I like sugar. I'll leave it at that. You guys can draw the draw the connection. Yeah, stripper here is I tend to think AWALT as not all women do, but they always can. Yeah, essentially. Just female nature. AWALT is a container word to describe anything that's inherently female nature. Well, guys do it too. Well, I don't fuck guys. So maybe all men do it. That's your problem. That's your problem, Susan. <laughs> Not mine. A lot of mechanics in chat. Yeah, well, to be fair, there's been a lot of people that uh, troll the chat. And so the, the wrench is the really easy way. Plus the fact that these guys keep a really clean ship. None of your bullshit ever gets through here. It's the, it's their goal. It's like, I want everybody here not to piss me off. And I was like, sounds good, boys. Go for it. Yeah, I have a theory that when you bond with somebody the first time and young, the bond may be stronger. Some people... No, Dev. Stop thinking like this. See, this is the problem. A lot... This is... Oh, this is... This is something that's been around since, like, the pickup days in the late 90s and the early 2000s. They called it mental masturbation. And it's just like people think of something and this sounds right and they're smart. It's like, yeah, this works. Doesn't work that way. I have a theory when you bond somebody the first time and the bond may be stronger. It's not stronger. If anything, if you really had to do it, the reason people tend to get hooked on their, their firsts is because they don't have any experience. You're 18 years old. You've slept with one girl. Of course that's going to be... And in 18 years, I have never seen a girl like this. You talk to a guy who's 30... And he's had a hundred girls in 10 years. He's like, they're just chicks, man. Everyone is no different. Yeah. Uh, what's wrong with Navy girls' plates? Oh, dear Lord. Okay. Do you really want to know? Do you really want to know? Do you want some of this smoke, sir? Let me walk you through. I don't remember which. I know Melissa. I had her in the book. I don't think I had the. Oh, no. And the lesbian. That's right. <laughs> The third one was, um, Jesus, how am I going to say this and make it not cancelable? She was a First Nations girl who I thought was Southeast Asian. And I didn't realize she was a single mom until we were fooling around and I, uh, I, 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 and then milk shot out and I was like, oh, fuck. And I remember, like, I don't know if I made a face, but I remember it's like, play it cool. You're in the middle of sex. Don't, don't, don't let it phase you. 
And so that was kind of fun. And then she started sending calls to me. It's like, um, hey, my baby's dad's out of town. What are you up to? And that line fucking that's it ended right there. It's like, oh, my God. I, I first off, I'm not a big fan of being a homewrecker. I don't want to be if it happens. Like, I have no control over it, but I'm not going to actively be like, yes, I'm going to steal this single mom from her baby daddy. But at the same time where it's just like, yeah, he does the father thing when he has to go out for work. Come on over and plow me. And I'm just like, Ugh, I just didn't want to be that guy. And so, yeah, we I broke that one off. So um, the second one was a lesbian, which I talked about in the book. And the third one was Melissa, the single mom who a lot of single moms in the military, a lot of lesbians, too. I don't understand it. So, yeah, so that was my three. And I was like, no. So, yeah, if that helps, if that helps you make a decision on who to and who not to date, there's my two cents. Take it for what it's worth. Yeah, Stripper's right. Your first pop is RC Cola. You think RC Cola is good. Then time passes, you have Coke, and then you wonder why anyone would ever like RC Cola. Exactly. And that's when Ryan got his milk kink. Shut up, Marty. I swear to God, Marty. You're going to give me lactose intolerance with that smoke. 100 girls in 10 years. Can it be done? I would assume so. I mean, you just do the math. That's 10 girls a year. That's less than one girl a month. That's 52 weeks. That's one girl every five weeks. One girl every five weeks. If you're going out every weekend, that's two days a week. So that's 100 days that you're actively going to look for somebody to sleep with. And that's if you're only doing the weekends, no online thing. If you're just approaching and bar game and all that shit, right? If you meet people through social circles, then I will get higher. But yeah, if you're committed to 10 years of straight debauchery, absolutely you can make it. Now, 1,500 in 10 years, I'd argue that's a little less, a little less likely. Unless you want to sleep with, uh, what did what did the fucking Denny's boy sleep with? He's like, yeah, most of these girls were women. Some were prostitutes. There was a couple trans. And he's like, all right. Basically, you're just throwing it into anything, right? Well, when you're drunk at Denny's, 20 bucks is 20 bucks. <laughs> it's been a while since I've been timed out. I'm not going to time you out, man. I can't time you out. All right. I'm going to do one more book at, yes, you know what? Nah, let's have some fun. Let's make fun of uh, Not So Bright. So I used to be a pretty strong feminist. I've actually become a feminist again. Ooh. Feminists, though, can be some of the worst people you'll ever meet. They can be, like, some of the most nasty. They'll take advantage of uh, contradictory uh, world values, right? Worldview, which is that, like, I'm talking about, like, psychology and mental health for men. And yet yeah. I'm in a field that, like, is overly feminized and shoving drugs down men's throat. And I'm, like, and I'm yeah. still recommending it because I don't want to lose, like, <laughs> the baby out with the bathwater. Just because not all therapists are well-trained to work with men. Just because a lot of therapists might even be biased against particularly, like, incel-type men. If they hear misogynistic language at all, they might, like, shut yeah. you down. So and it was just difficult because I didn't want to be, like, super, like, nasty and mean or anything. <laughs> Sleeper with a $2 super chat. Naked, fun time, and a milkshake. Win-win. You know what? It didn't feel like a win at the time. But I'm also a huge proponent of sometimes you have to learn this lesson the hard way. So to be fair, anybody who actually needs to hear that advice isn't going to listen. And so you're going to have to go learn it the hard way. But hear me now. Believe me later. Go through your go through your sailor rotation and then you'll realize. Also, you can't send a super chat with the word sex in it. Yeah, what most people do is they type it like this. They use segs. It's like a TikTok thing. And that's how you can get it through the, the filters and still talk about it. Honestly, that episode was educational for all the unintended reasons. <laughs> I like it. That's funny. Yeah, the roar. Dude, that's my favorite part where it's got that alpha lion roar to it. I don't know what it is. Like it's an MLG thing, but just the vibe of putting that in there where it's like proud and unapologetically just being a dumbass and i just like the right lion behind it because it's got that bravado you know it's like wearing two apple watches like that's the voice version of that that's why i love that ryan roar that one and then the air horn when it's like rabble rousing i think it was it might have actually been one of you guys saying this that the thing you liked about these little things was they're they're so fast paced that you have to watch them more than once like you'll watch it and you'll just like the spectacle of it will be entertaining but then if you slow down and you actually like read all the things I put in and then you kind of catch all the references, you realize it's like a very densely packed shit post. <laughs> like uh, for that erudite one, the one that makes me laugh the most is when people realize uh, where she's like, I don't want to. And she's like, I don't want to throw away the science or something. And then I kind of pause. And for like a quick frame, it's like, I don't want to, you know. Uh, lose my audience, not have clout, not have your attention, not have your love. Basically, like, fame whore shit. And then with that, like, it's an inner thought that she's having. And then she goes on to say something else. It was, 
Like I said, it's it's smarter than you give it credit for, but it's not smart enough to be good. Hey, Couch, the Alpha AK. Ooh, AKs are Alpha. $5 one cent chant. Hey, Couch, I've been contemplated buying Rule Zero version of Fuck Files. What's the difference between both versions? You can't buy it. The Rule Zero version, it's up there, but there shouldn't be any copies. It was, I got an artist that uh, I follow on Twitter. His name's Garange. And I had him commission me a piece to do for the cover of it. And I added an extra, like a half chapter at the beginning. And then I just gave those away to anybody who jo who was going to the Rule Zero conference we had back in 2020. And it ended up being online because, you know, somebody fucking ate a bat. And so it was just my, because I was, I was, they aren't cheap tickets, which it's an expensive event. And the online one was kind of that. So we dropped the price a bit and gave everybody a thing and. I didn't want to just have people pay to hear us run our mouths a little bit and talk and then, you know, learn. Some, and then you'll learn some things. And that's absolutely right. But I always just like having a little bit extra. And so I made like gift packages for guys. I sent them in, and it was a special edition of the book and it was all signed. And I sent that off to them. So that's what it is. It's almost like a collector's thing. I'm assuming you do all the editing for ads. Impressive. Oh, yeah, dude. It's part of part of my YouTube journey has learning to be better at making videos. And I think you can see the difference. Like I could, I used to do a thing where I would do like a director's commentary over a video so you can see like the editing process that I make. I'm pretty good at it. I've, I've been working my ass off to get better at it. So we all missed out. Well, not all of you. There's about 20 of you that did get it. I think I still have, yeah, I still have the one copy behind me. That's the last, that's the last one. They're out of print. I'm not bringing them back. I've only got the license for those copies too from Garage, so. But, uh... Yeah. So like if you watch my first one of these, I want to say the first one was, yeah, here's the first ad. Here's funny thing. Boom. What's up, fam? Got some big news to share that unfortunately is not so good. So I'm going to jump right into it. You're going to watch this video and you're going to cry. At least we can laugh at your ass as you cry like in, in the corner like a little girl in the fetal position. Funny, relatively simple, gets the point across. It's got a little bit of depth to it, right? And then the newest one. Hey, brother, who do you think is the funniest member of Rule Zero Squad? Now? It's your favorite comment joke of theirs. I think Ryan brings good laughs. He does. <laughs> Ryan is like British humor. It's like Monty Python. <laughs> People are like, and if you get it, you laugh your ass off. If you don't get it, you're like, <laughs> Fuck Ryan Stone. People just don't get his humor. Who's the funniest one on there? You mean besides John Fitch? <laughs> I think John Fitch is the funniest member of Rule Zero, but he's unintentionally funny. One of the robot dogs. The same this robot dog in real life was pretty surreal and terrible. And yeah, Cappy's pretty funny. He can be pretty funny, too. Who's the funniest member? Do you see what I mean, though? Like, that's, that's, if you put some concerted effort into it, you can really work on your craft. And so I've always tried to have, and this is just, I know I'm, like, just watching your videos and, like, yeah, relax. I'm getting to a point here for you guys. There's something, remember when I asked, like, half an hour ago, how are people not curious? How do people not want to learn more? How do people not want to delve into it? There's this curiosity and willingness to learn that people just don't have now. And I don't understand it. It's not even that I wish they did. I don't understand not having it. There's people that are making YouTube videos on the Manosphere. And they've been doing it longer than me. And they still have the same shitty video. No subtext. It's just, you know, straight shot and run your mouth for 10 minutes. Run an ad and call it. They don't do anything clever. They don't learn anything better. They don't learn subtext. Like every edit you make changes the story you tell. Technically, this long, uninterrupted two hour take is the most honest film you can make. As soon as you add an edit, a lie is in the edit. Yeah, the ending with the robot dog. And that was uh, Mr. Oizo's flat beat. And I was like, how much of this can I get away with using where it's still considered uh, the choice? But that's the point. Like, how could you be doing this for five years and you're still making the same piece of shit videos that don't get any views? And it's not even like there's a huge, well, you have to buy 50,000. Like, no, man. Da Vinci Resolve is professional. Like, they did the Marvel Avengers movies in Da Vinci Resolve. The program's free. 80% of its functionality is 100% free. And if that extra 20% is stuff you really don't need. You, get, you can add, like, a faux film grain. You get a speed editor. That's basically all that's required to get uh, the, the $600 license for. But, you know, it's a great write-off. Nobody bothers to use it. Nobody bothers to learn what they're doing. <clears throat> and this is, what, this is why I think 
there is space in the red pill space for like really good content creators. Like Glenn, I want to have a chat with Glenn one of these days because he actually does like film stuff for a living. He and Savo. So like that kind of professional level quality, I can see somebody taking over this space if they just get the right level of marketing to go along with the uh, the technical skill and the ideas. It really would be something interesting, but it's just easier to yell at women. Hey, she's fat. She needs to lose some weight. Ah, if your husband beats you, take her back. Endure, ladies. Endure. Fuck that. Yeah, DaVinci Resolve is great. Just got to go around the old mental Adobe programming. Oh, yeah, dude. It's It took me... Uh, it took me a month to get my head around the basic stuff, but that if you if you are used to a different editing software, they all have a completely different workflow, so there is a learning curve. What I would suggest is just start with the most basics. How do you import a video, make one cut, and then export the video? You start with that, and then just add one feature every time you want to do something, and then eventually you'll have it down. Eventually, you might even get to that point where you get these. Like, There's some really awesome features it has, like... Uh, the special effects stuff. It has like this matrix. I don't even know how to explain it, but it's like literally a web where you want to add certain effects, filters. You want to have things follow. You want to have 3D stuff in there. It's like a good example of this is I have a video on my channel where I, but just before I, I released my first book where, Hey, I did, I wrote a book and there was a pan shot where you see there's a map behind me of the world. And I like would have it automatic, like blink places that I'd been to kind of pop into it and they track along with it. That shot took me three days for a five-second pan shot with text. So it's just great. I've been using ClipChamp free version. Dude, DaVinci's free. Just get that. Trust me. What does Glenn do for film? I guess he uh, was on the production staff for... What the fuck was that movie? Uh, the one with the time travel and uh, the Twilight guy. Anyways, yeah. So he was doing like Hollywood work. So it's pretty cool. Uh, these content creators all play to the emotions of a teenager child, not to a standard. Yeah, but I get that. But I mean, I don't know. Like I said, for me, it's just even in the military, I was never a big fan of the military, but I was like not a fan of being that fucking guy. Like, I never wanted to be that guy at work. So I did my job and I did it well. Pickup was the same thing. Uh, like being an extrovert going out, I always just say be, uh, being an extrovert it's a job that I'm good at, but it's a job I don't like. I'm not an extrovert. I can do it. I can run my mouth. I can be the life of a party, and that's fine. But then afterwards, I got to sit there and stare at a wall for an hour to fucking unwind. I just don't understand why people don't care. You're doing this for a living. You've decided, look, no shame. If you want to make clout your thing, if you want to be a VTuber, if you want to paint your hair blue and become an ass model for Instagram, at least fucking do it. No, 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 no. I got Movie Studio 16 for like 30 bucks, and that's basically Sony Vegas with different badge. It's pretty dope. I've been using it for five years. Oh, wait, Tenant, thank you. Yeah, Dreamcast, I'm telling you. Look, I've, I I know this is totally off topic. We have been off topic for like a little bit now, but if you do eventually get into DaVinci Resolve, you will never go back. You will not believe how much stuff that you could have been doing that you don't do. It is amazing. And they've even got new features. If you get the new version, they've... So it used to be you'd have to go into each clip and do all of the different types of uh, fiddling around with the effects in that. They now have this feature of a, of a, it's like a different type of film clip, adjustment clips. You put it over top of your footage, do all the changes to that, and then it'll affect whatever clips below it. So you don't even have to alter the original films anymore. And you can like plug and play if you make specific effects or specific editing techniques you want to use. It's, it's the amount of work I save when I switched over. Because I think I used, a, was it Final Cut or something like that? Like, it easily saved probably about 60% of my work time that it would spend on editing a video. It used to be like an all-day event to edit a video. And now, if I'm, depending on the complexity of it, I can have something up and running in 45 minutes at better quality. Yeah, I'd spend my time finding a good AI tool. That's the problem, man. AI, everybody keeps talking about how it's going to be great. It's not. I've tried. I mean, I tried. At first, I was like, you know what? I'm going to send it. I put a page of my book in there, Fuck Files. And I asked the program, like, just do some basic copyright editing, punch up the language, right? What can you do with that? It kicks me out of the program. It's like, nope, against terms of service, you're fired. Ban my account. I was like, what the fuck is this? I mean, fair enough. And then I tried doing it for video edits. The problem is it didn't know what to edit. 
it didn't know what to do. I'd have to handhold it so much that I was essentially not only having to make my own video edits for like shorts and that, but I'm also having to train the software at the same time. And I'm like, why would I waste all this time for a five second or a five cent short on software that's just basically making me pay money to train it? I'm like, fuck that. Tweets, all that stuff. It's just, it's one of those things that when you're creative, so AI can't create anything. AI can just synthesize stuff that already exists. And the more creative your stuff is, the harder it's going to be for AI. Like my girl uses it all the time. If she needs to send an email to a vendor or something like that, she can pull up AI and get the exact verbiage she's looking for because corporate speak is very standardized. Most things aren't reinventing the wheel. And so it's very good at that. But if you're creative, it just sucks. Uh, Devnull, 25 PLNs. Thanks to you, I have a girlfriend, but one end is strong with me and I can't just dump her. She started to talk about sex without condoms. Help. Oh, what, really? Um, Where to start with this one? Like, obviously, you know about always being in control of the birth control, right? Which is most likely why you're wearing condoms, and I'd strongly suggest it. I was a huge proponent of those as well. But she wants you to go raw. I guess the question is, and this is kind of where you have to put everything together, right? So I don't know your situation. Uh, congrats on the girlfriend, by the way. Like, is she at the baby rabies stage? Is it she really wants a kid? Because a lot of times, girls just like when you raw dog in there. I remember I was in the military, and I was on my threes course. And I remember asking a girl about this that I was on course with. It's like, what is it with girls and condoms? Like, And she's like, have you ever tried to fuck in a garbage bag? And I, I was like, oh, okay, I get it. Turns out they just don't like the feeling. But um, if, they got, if she's got an IUD, you're pretty much safe there. If she's on the pill, you got to trust that she's taking it consistently. But I like this. I have one anus is strong and I can't just dump her. Of course you can. That's If you've red-pilled anything, this is what you need to learn. Assertive Bill of Rights. You are allowed to do anything that you want. You're allowed to not consider the goodwill of others. So in other words, you're not worry, you don't have to worry about if she's going to be okay before you decide to break up with her, if you want to. You don't have to worry about making sense you don't have to worry about there being a good acceptable reason she's allowed to get mad and hurt and not like it and be mean to you if you break up with her like all this stuff's allowed to happen it's a it's a great book that just gives yourself to permission to live your life it's weird that you have to do that in this day and age but like i said failed parenting strategies you kind of have to give guys the married red pill seal of approval in order to do what you were going to do anyway and learn to think the hard way yeah Take control of the birth control. Yeah, that is the rule. Now, don't get me wrong. A lot of guys swear by pulling out. And I'm like, if you want. An IUD is just so much easier, though. Of course, once you start bringing that up with girls, you'll it's amazing how many girls have a copper allergy once you bring that up. And you're like, yeah, there's non-hormonal ones. Oh, it's, I just don't like the feeling of it. I'm like, All right, whatever. You don't really feel anything of it. They'll try and scare guys. Oh, you're going to totally snag it on your Johnson's. Like, it's trust me, dude. If you're that long, you're going to be causing more damage than that. <laughs> Yeah, don't ever trust it. How many lives have been created? Oh, a ton of them. A ton of them. Yeah, the best is when she has a latex allergy. Oh, yeah, there's that one, too. Hell, they used to even have... And that's, you know what the shitty thing is? Women are so fucking good at, like, nagging until they get what they want. They used to have... I remember this. As a kid... Well, a kid. I was, like, 13. And in back, it was the coolest thing to have a condom in your wallet back then. But they used to have spermicide in condoms. So it was, like, literally was able to prevent pregnancy even if you had a break even if it fell off even if a girl tried to sperm jack you there was something in there that physically killed the sperm which was awesome and you know what happened there was this chick in germany who argued that it caused an adverse reaction and so they banned the substance from condoms that's why condoms don't have it anymore what they neglected to mention is that she was a german prostitute and it was because she had basically been fucking 10 hours a day for a solid year and then finally had a reverse averse reaction to it. So it wasn't that spermicide was bad. It's that she was just so heavily dosed that anything she'd have put in her cooter would have killed her. So yeah. You don't feel the device but the wires. Well, it's not. It's like a little anchor. That's all that is. So yeah, Dev, if you really wanted to go that route, just say, you know what? We need to plan. If we're going to go this route, you should get an IUD. Of course, then you got to take it on her word that she has one. But I guess if you find out if she gets pregnant, all of a sudden you're like, well, I guess she didn't wear an IUD. 
Uh, copper in this doesn't. It's toxic because it's not water soluble. It's a metallic form. Yeah, I know that. But like I said, it's girls. Girls make up excuses. It's like how every girl is gluten intolerant now. Every girl has a celiac disease. They don't actually. It's this weird form of like women celiac where uh, the closer you are to another person, the more gluten intolerant you are. But when you're by yourself, it's fucking candy and cupcakes all fucking day, you know? Cappy was right. Vasectomy. Well, I'm not going to suggest or not suggest. It is an option. And again, typical thing. Girls are like, you know, it's not 100% reversible. It's like, probably not. The only reason I don't, I wouldn't recommend it is because it's so fucking difficult. Like doctors in Canada won't give it to you until you've had either two kids or you're 40 years old. Like they, they just won't. They consider it an ethical thing not to do what you want. They'll give you hormones, but they won't give you a vasectomy. Um, there is the, I think it's 25% chance that, chance that it's not reversible, which I don't know if that's number good or not, but there's always ways around that. There's like I, IVF. Yeah, basically IVF. They take a syringe, they grab the boys, and they put them in. They they inject it in her for you. So there's like ways around this stuff, but you guys know all the tech that's out there. There's IUD, there's the pill, there's birth control, there's vasectomy, there's condoms, there's pulling out, and everyone has its own drawbacks and trade-offs. And you just have to be mindful of that and pick a path that works for you when it comes to planning your future. Reversal surgery in the Netherlands is 3K. Yeah, on and a baby costs 500K, so... If I was young, I'd probably freeze my jizz and get a vasectomy. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I never did. But for me, it was just... For me, condoms was fine. I had no problems. In fact, it worked out better anyway because the beauty of condoms is it is it numbs it just enough that you can go hard for a long time and not have to worry about it. So I was like, that's perfect. Plus, I was never a big fan of surgery. <laughs> uh, there's high-dose test too. Oh, yeah, I guess. If this, if it's a girl you care about, your daughter, don't use them. We disagree on toxic load, but chat is not great for debate. What the fuck are we talking about? What does Silver bring up? All right, whatever. There's also the rhythm method. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyways, this is going to be it for the topic. I think we're at the end. Let's, uh... You know what? I've actually been pretty hard on Stedman. I won't make fun of him. Do I have any more books? Yeah, another book one. Charles Bukowski. Jordan Peterson, Neil Strauss. I like these guys. Add some salt to cover up the bitterness of middle-aged soccer moms and put in the oven for 45 minutes. Optionally, you can take from all this stuff what you want and leave the rest. So enjoy Fuck Files. 15 lessons from a decade of women, now on audio. Yay! Uh, Rule Zero today is going to be on Clary's channel. I don't know the topic yet. I have to go look at it. It's going to be fun. I would redirect, but he still hasn't turned it on. Beyond that, glad you guys enjoyed. It's a bit of a different pace. This one was a bit more crowd pleasing or crowd uh, crowd work and audience stuff. Rules here at your mom's house, so you'll have to go find it the old fashioned way. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in. I'll catch you guys on the next one. As always, fuck files, praxeology volume one at Amazon in audio form and in paperback. Uh, praxeology volume two, dread is still underway. The first draft is finished. The second draft is almost finished. We're starting on the editing process now. If you want to see the progress, go to the Ryan Stone Substack, and you can follow along. You get a lot of excerpts from it, so you know exactly what you're getting into. On that note, I'll catch you guys on the next episode. Seventy-nine T twenty-four fifty-eight Learning Corp. Little Red Riding Hood, take one.